You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Mark Sturgis, longtime organic farmer and compost creator. Mark lives on his farm in Bandon, Oregon, where he makes and ships organic compost and compost critters. Mark's a writer whose work has appeared in Acres USA, and his book of poetry, The Return of the Fertilizer King and Other Tales, is about, you guessed it, compost and nature and bugs. So we'll learn about that um, in this interview. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Mark. Thank you. Nice to be here. I want listeners to know that your compost is so highly regarded in the compost world. Um, One writer described it as so alive, it moves. And so we're going to learn soon about some of the many creatures that live in your compost and create it. Um, But first, I wanted to ask you about something that I, I read, a quote of yours that said, when we create a better habitat for beneficial insects, we create a better habitat for ourselves. Uh, correct. I I kind of run our farm here as an as an insect preserve. I'm surrounded by conventional cranberry bogs. They're, these people are just just spraying all around me. So this is one place where I have frogs. I have lots of lizards. Everybody lives here. Whereas you know you go to some of these um, these cranberry farms and it's like a biological desert. When you say that everybody lives here, you're not just talking about you and your family, human family. You're also talking about all the beneficial insects and decomposers that you work with. And what I found really interesting about your lectures and writings is that you often refer to these creatures as people. Right. Personification is very important to me because if I can get people to to think of compost or compost tea as as people maybe maybe they'll think less about killing them. That makes sense because I think a lot of people are probably freaked out by decomposers. Um, I know that soldier flies, I used to just really <laughs> not, uh, I didn't appreciate them. They kind of, they kind of freaked me out until I read about them and read how amazing they are um, as a valuable player in the compost pile. Could you tell our listeners why you feel that there is a need for healthy compost at this time? Well, it's just like anything else, you know, everything is so industrial. So much compost, commercial compost has been made with dairy compost, which I feel is is the worst manure you can use because the sodium content is way too high. So are you saying that a lot of commercial compost that we may purchase is made with cow manure, which isn't that healthy, or is it more the industrialization of the cattle that isn't healthy? Well, no, it, is, it isn't the healthiest, but it also, um, you can buy feedlot manure, which definitely isn't healthy. And there's a, there's a lot of a lot of compost you buy, you'll buy in a store where you can't even sprout stuff with it because of high sodium. I I don't think many creatures can live in such high sodium conditions. Correct, and it's just like you know when you're um, when you're going to the farmers market, you should know your farmer. Well, you should also you should know your manure source. So is manure a big ingredient in your compost? Well, in my compost, it is. It's you know, it's probably ninety percent of my um, my compost and ten percent organic vegetable matter. Oh, okay. So now I can see why it's super important to know how the animals whose manure you're using for your compost are treated and what type of um, 
supplements or dewormers that they have. And I think I heard a lecture that you did for Acres where you did talk a lot about deworming animals and the effect that can have on um, other creatures like dung beetles and other beetles. The people um, that I deal with take really good care of their animals. They never worm their animals. What effect does worming have on beneficial um, decomposers? Or, or those creature, those critters that you refer to as the good people, the ones we want in our compost. By worming your animals, all the parasites are resistant, um, except the good people. And so, when you're uh, worming your animals, um, all you're doing is killing the good people. Oh. And so, therefore, when that poop hits the ground, the beetles that come in, everybody comes in is or killed Mm -hmm. and so my my approach to compost or to agriculture or to anything i want life or death i i totally understand because really by using chemical dewormers you're wiping out the the good or the beneficial decomposers and then it sounds like the parasites have resistance well let's chat a bit about some of the decomposers that you work with When I was reading about you for um, this interview, I read that you like to work with the whole neighborhood. So tell us a bit about what you mean by that. Well, I mean by the whole neighborhood, um, it's like finally people are really studying the microbiome. The microbiome is very, very important to our our health, whether it's the microbiome of our skin, the microbiome of our gut, or even the microbiome of of our brain. And it's the same thing in the microbiota of our soils. We have to have those 90 trillion creatures living in the soil or living with us to keep everything going because we're not, we're not a monosystem. And hopefully your soil that you're creating or where you live, it can't be a monoculture either. Most vermiculture, they all, they, all they want is the worms compost or great soil is way beyond worms. And so let's chat a bit about, so some of the neighbors, quote, neighbors that may live in your bins. If we were to wander around your property in Bandon, Oregon, what might we see um, as far as your composting facility or your composting um, systems? What would we see if we were there with you now? Well, you'd see these these 23 uh, stainless steel bulk dairy tanks, which is where I create all the compost because I can maintain a a pretty stable culture temperature. When you, when you open the bin, um, you're just amazed because you see all the, the residue growing, like you'll see carrot tops or a lot, maybe some old, some old flax seeds are thrown in there and they'll be sprouting. Beet tops will be growing wild. And so when those things are growing wild, then I know that the, um, the soil is healthy in there, as well as you'll, you'll see all these little white dots or springtails. And, you know, they're, they're little microarthropods that can jump at least six or seven times their, their body to escape predators. Wow. And you'll see zillions of incotreids. Incotreids are a, a little white tiny worm that's somewhere between a a nematode and an earthworm. And they're one of the greatest decomposers on earth. And they've been, you know, they haven't been studied very much in this country. They're not as sexy as a dung beetle or or something like that. Uh, You'll see a lot of mites. If you have millions that you can see, you know, then there's trillions that that you can't see. I like to tell ranchers, it takes millions of little ones to grow a few big ones. So of the ones we can see, you've named some of those. And what about nematodes? Nematodes are um, really important. They live in our soil around here. I sent some, uh, some, a soil sample to um, a lab, a friend of mine, and he told me that I had nematodes that he hadn't seen since he was going to college in, in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is, is the hot place for the study of nematology. But nemat- nematodes 
back in those days when I used to sell a lot of uh, nematodes to to cranberry bogs because when you have a, a monoculture, then you have you have a lot more disease. These guys they had a lot of uh, root vine weevil. The root vine weevil just go in and and they just they just destroy a bog. They you know they're they're root parasites. And it had been known that you can control these root vine weevil anyway by using nematodes. And so I found by using heterabditis, which is it's a seeker, it'll chase the nematodes down. Where where Steiner Nema is a, a lurker, it waits for the nematodes to come to, to them and then ambush them. When a root vine weevil or some other creature is attacked by by nematodes, well, it's a really bad ending because they they go through any orifice they can lay their eggs inside and then there's some kind of an enzyme that they emit into the uh, host animal where it keeps it alive and until the um the larva can totally consume it from the inside out i've had root vine weevil larva looked at where you know there was like 60 or 70,000 nematodes uh, larvae inside eating the creatures. So it's a bad ending. Just like um, another thing that makes my va- my compost so valuable is the insect eating funga- fungus called Bavaria bassiani. Oh, I haven't heard of that. Could you tell us about that fungus? It, it's another thing that's kind of like um, nematodes. It'll lay a few spores into the host it just starts making these like rods and pretty soon mainly beetles are their toast. Wow. And Bassiani first discovered this this fungus years ago, eighteen forties. Interesting. I haven't heard of that scientist. This is really a valuable biological creature because I don't know if you read that article in Acres about Mimi Castile, but she, using our system, saved her entire block of Pinot called the Flat Block at Bethel Heights that was $65 a bottle retail, and it got Phloxera. And up until the time that Mimi started spraying more compost tea on her vineyard, it wasn't known that it could be a, a good vehicle to get it down to the root, roots of the vines. And so as far as we know, there's never been any vineyard that's recovered from phloxera. Uh, even if you, go, if you go back to the early 1900s when it was ravaging Europe till now. Wow. And so we were, we were pretty excited by that. And Jim Nardi is one of the great biologists in this country. And we, we agreed that we really believed that it was the Bavaria Bassiani that, that saved that vineyard. Wow. So that's a huge success stories. Right. We, you know, we think, you know, we think it is huge. Mm-hmm. Because I, I think I've read about that. Is it Phloxera? I don't know how to say it, but how it's wiped out vineyards in France, right, too? Yeah. Well, not only France, it wiped out Napa and Sonoma, the Central Coast. I mean, it's devastated California. Kind of, California's all been replanted since the, since the 80s. Now, this might be a naive question because I don't know as much about um, fungi and insects and compost critters as you, but so you have this insect eating fun- fungi. How do you, you can't control it. Like how, what keeps it from eating all the beneficials? Well, that's a great question, Joel, because one biologist once told me that you can't, they'll eat steak or they'll eat hamburger. They don't care. So do you just have to have many more of the beneficials? Right. You just want to be very zen with with balanced soil. Because if you have balanced soil, there's abundance of things to eat, like, you know, like, say, root vine weevil, or then um, that's what they're going to eat. But in my bins, you can you can really spot them because it, it just looks like suddenly there's a white spot on your on your beetle. It looks kind of like a, a white mold. And so when you go in your compost, and so it'll be like an old beetle carcass with this white uh, mold. You, you'll get one of those. And like, say, if you're going out to do a um, a job, 
you'll float one of these colonies in your compost tea. And so then you're, you're getting zillions of spores off it. And then by the time when you're almost finished, that colony's still floating on the, on the compost tea until you, you pick that, that colony up and just take it back home and put it back in your bin. And by colony, do you mean the beetle carcass? Or just the spores that you can see. Well, it's it's the it's the it's the beetle carcass mm-hmm. basically. So you can fine tune what you put in the compost tea, which we'll talk about in a minute for people who don't know what that is, by including certain things. Right, but I'm I'm a minimal minimalist, and I put you mm-hmm. know very very few things in my tea. Yeah, I want to talk about your tea, but lastly, so. So basically what it sounds like is you take the majority of your compost is manure. And if it's not cattle manure, what kind of manure are you using? You know, rabbit, alpaca, Mm -hmm. llama, goat. And none of them have been dewormed, it sounds like. No. With chemical. Okay. So that's an important thing. Because one thing that listeners should know is you do um, say that you encourage, let's see, you say that beetles should be at the top of the compost food chain. And so I have I have a big worm bin and I've had compost bins in the past. And I have to confess that I didn't see many beetles in my compost. So I'm curious, um, you really sing the praises of beetles and you actually talk about beetle enlightenment. Can you tell us how we can experience this? <laughs> well, one of the things that you can do as, as composters you know, the biggest source of compost is horse manure. And most people say, oh, no, horse manure is no good. And if so if you're just building compost for your, for your yard, I mean, you're not going commercial or anything, horse manure is fine. I built all the soil from my orchards with horse manure compost. All you have to do, train your people to not to worm their horses. I used to tell people, oh, do you worm your horses? Well, yes, yes, of course, you have to. Or a lot of vets, um, I don't know if they still do, but not that long ago. If Yeah, if you don't worm your animals, they're going to die of, you know, parasites. Well, I go, every time you worm your horse, do you take a, a good shot of Ivermic? Oh, God, no, of course not. I go, well, when I use a natural wormer on my cows, I eat diatomaceous earth all the time. What do you mean? Well, diatomaceous earth, apple cider vinegar, kelp, sea salt, all these things are something that that are okay for you to eat, and they're okay for your animals to eat. I, I try not to give my animals anything that I wouldn't eat myself. So if you're teaching people about their manure, you can educate them so so they're going, well, geez, okay, I won't worm anymore. Well, when you stop worming, all that stuff that you're bringing to your property is just going to be helped to build great soil. Wow. And so the reason that we don't see beetles maybe in our compost is if we're using manure is because of dewormers, would you say? Could be part of it? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's, a, that's a big part of it. And what is beetle enlightenment and why should we care about beetles? Well, we should care about beetles because we'll take, for instance, a row beetle. They're not as sexy as dung beetles are the rock stars of beetles. (laughs) But say row beetles, there's like 33,000 families. They're little squigglies. Mm -hmm. They can eat two and a half times their body weight in uh, microarthropods every day. Beetles, at least row beetles, they inject a, a digestive fluid into their host. When 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 you're attacked by a row beetle, it's not going to be a good ending because he's gonna he's gonna inject you with this digestive fluid that starts digesting your this host, and then he'll come back a couple of la- hours later and, and finish up. They all day long, 24 hours a day. I used to like to say you really need these beetles because they're the perfect farmhand. They'll work 24 hours a day. They'll come to work. They don't take drugs and they don't beat their wife. Maybe they digest her externally. <laughs> um, that, that, that is possible. We've just talked about the beetles. You know, they're pretty brutal. It's just a world out there where these beetles and all these other creatures, they're just, 
they're just procreating, eating, and just uh, going about the world. But it, it's brutal. It is brutal. And I, I, it's, you know, it makes me think when you're describing all of this, it's like science fiction movies, <laughs> like with the extraterrestrials who do all these things. And there's such a world underneath our feet and around us that we have no clue what's going on. Exactly. And, and my, my duty is to get people to, to look at these things instead of just us stepping on them and kill them. Because most biologists have never even taken an etymology class. Most of the etymology departments have been eliminated by under the influence of, of big ag in this country. There's very few etymology departments left. And that's something we really should be concerned about, because not only do we depend on insects for pollination and for creating soil, we're finding out today in this interview, and taking care of the non-beneficials that can wipe out vineyards, I think we definitely need to become educated about insects. Correct. Now, on a larger scale, and then we'll go back to compost, but pasture land is actually suffering due to a lack of beetles. Could you just tell us a bit about that? In 1945 or something, until up until that time, um, diatomaceous earth was your basic wormer of choice. And then these chemicals came along. When dung beetle populations are where they should be, and I've been on, on ranches in this country where the populations were what they were supposed to be, in Australia, you know, is a prime example of where they where they should be. They can bury a ton per acre of manure per day. Oh my gosh! And so, when you take all the manure underground, there aren't any greenhouse gases. Wow! So, do, wow! From manure, and that's that's one of the biggest bad raps that the cattle industry gets is you know all these uh, this cow flatulence. We're saddled with that because of um, CAFOs. CAFOs. So for those who don't know what that is, I think it's concentrated or confined animal feeding operations. Correct. We've seen a lot of studies on this. Like Truman Fincher was was all set to release all these these dung beetles. He'd done all his, qu his quarantine work. And he, he was at Texas A&M. So he was the main dung beetle person in this country. And when he was just ready to re release all these dung beetles, the USDA came in and said, no, no, you got to get rid of all your research. You're going to lose your pension. And so it's taken from 75 until until the 90s, 2000s, where, where dung beetles have actually come back in this country pretty much on their own. I had a friend, I believe he's dead now from Nebraska, but he, he was this goat farmer and he and he took all these incredible pictures where these these goats and these these cows, when the poop hit the ground, within you know twenty minutes, these dung beetles were flying in. Within three days, there wasn't any evidence that there'd ever, ever been any poop there, except maybe you know the grass was a little greener around there. But outside that poop were these these dead parasites or some of them were really big. There's roundworms. There's all kinds of things, wow. but the, the beetles just um, ate up all the habitat for these parasites. So when you think about that, instead of everything happening like that within three days, well, when you have an animal that has ivermec or any, any number of these, of these wormers, when the poop hits the ground, and the dung beetles fly in and they're killed, it's the opposite of what I just described to you. Nothing happens except flies and disease come and all these horn flies, all this other stuff. When poop hits the ground, the first thing you'll see is these dung beetles coming in, hydrophilids, which are a, a water beetle that's, that's dung loving. These other little red beetles look like a, a big, big ladybug without spots. They're there. And pretty soon, after about three weeks, when you, here on the South Coast, things don't happen quite as fast. But the last thing you see is ants. And so these dung beetles, 
worms get all the credit, but you know, in my in my bins, when I put fresh uh, manure in there, the beetles are always there before the worms. Oh my gosh, I think I see the light and I am now beetle enlightened because if you think about it, dung beetles and beetles in general, um, could they could be climate change heroes and also they help um, reduce the risk of disease. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I, I read an article, this article said losing, le- losing beetles was much more dire than losing polar bears. Wow, I, I really, I had no idea that beetles were so important in the compost food chain and also the world until today. And um, so, Mark, what you're saying is that beetles are actually at the top of the food chain in your compost bins. Right, because I tried to uh, keep the compost rule in, in my ecosystem compost. I keep the, the quarter rule, which means there aren't any openings in your bin. They're bigger than a um, quarter mm-hmm. because if it's bigger than a quarter, you know, a chipmunk or a, a mouse can get in your compost and um, eat your creatures or eat vegetable matter that you put in there that you want. You want all those old avocados and stuff and melons and things like that. You want the Inca trade to eat those, not the... Um, rats or, or mice or chipmunks. If the hole is bigger than a quarter, they'll get in there. I've seen chipmunks coming out of, of stainless steel dairy tank. You'll, how could that happen? <laughs> how could they get through there? They're determined. They're like, there's good food in here. So so you're creating this um, beneficial habitat for these creatures, including beetles and all the others that we've talked about. How do you create the conditions to keep them healthy and alive? and decomposing for you. I used to tell my dad, my pitchfork is the foundation of my empire. You have to keep it turned because if you don't, the uh, creatures only go down, only work work six inches down, and then you get this horrible compaction that if you keep turning it and give them fresh fresh material to work with, then they'll, they'll keep it churned up themselves. And you know, once you can't recognize what what uh, the vegetable matter is, you know that it's time to turn it. And Mark, when you, so you have your manure and then you have your food scraps. Do you just add that at one time and then you don't add any new material? Is that correct? No. Oh, okay. Because you, you always want to keep a certain part of your compost as a starter. So you're always re-inoculating. And are you, do you add a food scraps ever again or no? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're, it's like a continual feeding kind of. Right. Until it gets time to ship it, then you sh- you'll ship that. Maybe you'll harvest like three quarters of your bin and then you'll start over. But you'll keep that quarter in there as your culture. Hmm, interesting. And then one thing that it seems like you stressed is that you keep the compost very wet. Right. To a certain point, you want to keep it really wet. Beyond that, as it starts to dry out, you lose creatures. So in a dry climate, you would advocate watering your compost. Right. I never water mine, except when I start a new bin, I'll come home with, with new manure put the manure in there, well, then then it, this manure may be really dry. And so then I'll just water it down to get it started. And, and you, know, you want to be careful and use, use new manure because you don't want it to get above 83 degrees because that, that's when worms leave. And that's what I was going to ask you because I felt like I f- think that manure is really hot, can get really hot, right? And heat it up when it's decomposing. Right, mm-hmm. right. I only use, you know, manure from my chicken house in my static piles where I don't care because it's my compost. I don't sell any of my static compost. I just use static compost for my own my own needs. And so you don't containerize chicken manure. These other manures, they calm down pretty fast. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So basically, like I have a worm bin at home that built out of recycled wood that I feed the ki- food scraps to every week or so. And then I'll move the food scraps around the bin, you know, and 
give one side a rest. And so is your, is your compost, it sounds like we were saying earlier, is continual feeding until you're ready to ship it. So does that mean when you ship it, it, the compost has a lot of inhabitants in it, like insects and. Right. Well, I sift it. I keep all the worms, but basically everybody else um, goes to live with somebody else. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hopefully they're as nice as you. <laughs> they know they know how to take care of them. And, you know, that brings me to compost tea, which I feel um, maybe you could explain to us what that is and why that might be more practical to apply to large areas of land instead of um, raw, you know, regular compost. That's a good point. A great point, actually. Through the years, one of the things that, that's made me the most angry and most frustrated is there's all these people master gardeners, people even write for acres say, oh no, compost tea, it's snake oil. These are, or people have a good reputation. And I just want to trash them yeah. when I hear that. Because the reason <laughs> mm-hmm. co- most compost tea isn't any good is basically two reasons. One, brewer you're using isn't good. Or two, you're starting out with low grade compost, which is the major problem. Vermicompost is is okay. It makes decent compost, but you have to have all these creatures to have zillions and zillions of creatures. You have to start out with zillions and zillions of creatures, and most people don't start out with that. You know, they'll make compost and then they'll they'll put it into a brewer that doesn't have the proper oxygen, or it'll be um, a brewer where it recycles the water It's a, as, as a recycling pump where all your creatures are getting ground up every cycle through the pump. Ah, so like the recirculation pumps? Right. I've always talked about that. You can't have a recirculation pump. You have to just, it has to be strictly an air diffuser brewer. And I know that you have a brewer. I think you invented the Nervinator. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Yeah. <laughs> And I read that you said the airflow is like class four rapids. <laughs> Correct. Um, so what, so you're saying you just need really fast airflow. And I think you said also a round bottom. Right. I've scaled back a mm-hmm. little. So now these days I'm just using a 55 gallon brewer because it's just a lot easier than climbing into a 500 gallon tank and cleaning it and stuff. I have a rope ladder down and I always make sure I have my cell phone with me in case uh, I I get trapped in there. (laughs) And then the compost, someone turns it on and (laughs) that would not be a good end, Mark. Stay, be be sure to bring your phone in there. (laughs) But um, I mean, it's empty at that point, but it's still Mm -hmm. um, a pretty good climb down. So this, 55 gallon barrel I'm having is a flat bottom, but I've got a diffuser that is a nine inch disc diffuser that sits right on the bottom of this flat bottom. And so most most brewers have cone bottom tanks. You can't get your diffuser totally in the bottom of that tank. And so you're creating anaerobic conditions. Whereas if you're using a round bottom tank, you can get your diffusers totally in the bottom. And uh, the same with this flat bottom, 55-gallon barrel. This diffuser is pretty much totally in the bottom. So you want to avoid all anaerobic locations. Mm, because does that breed kind of the, the characters that we don't really want in our compost? Right. You don't want creatures with black lagoon yeah. in your compost tea. <laughs> um. And then another thing that you did differently, and maybe, well, I'll ask this, and then I wanted to talk a bit more about tea, but you also do extended brewing on your compost tea. I'm very fortunate. Like most protozoa don't even show up until after 22, 22, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And so all this, this tea is going out without protozoa, without many protozoa. And so when you when you brew past 24 hours, you're getting a lot more protozoa. I'm glad you brought that up because speaking of protozoa, because there's a lot of rotifers in my um, compost. They're a creature that loves to eat bacteria. They carry their insisted egg with them. 
And so when wetlands, anything like that, when they dry out, the um, rotifer becomes dormant. And then the next spring or when they're the cranberries or whatever, they're doing their water cycle, when there's water, it comes again. Well, that egg hatches and the rotifer is in business once again. They've also found in fish farming, using rotifers in the ocean, that they have a, a big problem getting the fry in these uh, ocean species, like sea bass and stuff like that, getting the fry from to a fingerling stage. That was the, one of the hardest things because they, they lose just massive amounts of fish during that, that metamorphosis. They discovered that by feeding them rotifers, that metamorphosis was met. So they're a very valuable member of the food chain. So rotifers' role in the compost bin would be to, did you say eat bacteria? Right. They So when you put them out on your crop or your field mm-hmm. or your pasture, they're just eating bacteria 24 hours a day. Wow. And do they live in water? Is that, are they water creatures? Yeah, they're, they're, um, they're kind of a wetland water creature, but that's the beauty. When you keep your um, compost damp, they can live in your compost. Oh, wow. I never have heard of them. That's amazing. It's a whole world. Like we were saying, it's the universe beneath our feet. It's incredible. Well, and this other beetle that we have here, Argitid, it's a very rare beetle. It used to single-handedly decompose two tons of pumpkins a year. Oh my gosh. Good Lord. They're, they're baro- <laughs> they have um, good appetites. <laughs> they're a generalist because they'll do food scraps as well as dung. Who does all the work? It, well, especially for this beetle is the, uh, the larva. You'll see them. And then two weeks later, there'll be like about 50 or 60 larva eating beetles or squash or what, what have you. I mean, it's incredible to to see them. And the beauty about them is they show up when the weather gets bad and they're gone when the weather gets good. The opposite of fair weather friends. (laughs) I mean, they do most of their work in the winter. I know these hardworking decomposers and getting back to compost tea. So the tea is actually, I know you've applied it to vineyards, to cranberry bogs, to orchards, um, what have been the results of applying tea to plant for the plants and soil? I like to say that the pastures that I control around here that I did, they, um, they're the healthiest, greenest pastures in Coos County. And one of the early trials that I did before I had my sprayer, I sprayed the sheep pasture. The guy, I didn't have a sprayer and All he had was a six-foot boom sprayer that went on his um, four-wheeler. And so we took all the orifices out of the sprayer. The tea just went straight down. Um, We did this, and uh, I hadn't seen him. It was like January. I saw him at the post office and said, Mark, you got to come by and look at this pasture. And I go, no, what happened? He goes, no, no, you'll like it. And so I went there, and it was... January, been grazed by 400 sheep, and it was a five-acre parcel. Everywhere that that tea had ran straight down, there was all these bright green lines of the pasture. Wow. Wow. It was so it was like an experiment that we did accidentally. Yeah, and so it almost jump-started the plant growth, would you say, in the... Yeah, exactly. Like what you can do with compost, good compost tea that you can't do with, like I couldn't, I couldn't take care of all the acres in this country that I take care of, that I ship to. I couldn't make enough compost. Mm. People call up and they, they say, okay, I'll take a yard. And I said, no, I don't think it will. And they go, why? And they because the yard of my compost is like 32,000 bucks. Wow. They go, oh, so I guess I don't. Uh, by using tea, you can get the same effect of all this biology jumpstart that you could get by using tons mm-hmm. of compost and hoping for rain. So once you spray the compost tea on your land, you need to keep it moist, it sounds like. Well, at first. But, mm-hmm. but the thing is, I saw him a, a year ago, and this was in 2005, 
and he he claimed there was still he was still getting residual off that that pasture. Mm-hmm. I see that residual like most of. The, I haven't sprayed any pastures around here for two or three years, and even in our own pastures, we haven't sprayed probably for four or five years at least. But you know, by by using good rotational grazing, we have the probably one of the best pastures in the Rug Valley, and the other thing about about not using wormers is mm-hmm. the first time they came to to butcher our cows, they go, well, you you won't be able to keep these livers. And we go, well, I don't know why. They go, oh, because there's there's too many liver flukes in this area. There's a 85% liver fluke rate in the area where we ranch. We've never had a liver condemned for 11 years, and. of the other people that worm, they get flukes. Wow. Well, we have great dung beetles. It's just amazing to hear it. It's all connected and all these relationships that these microbes and creatures, decomposers have with each other. You know, when you were speaking about compost tea and applying it to large areas of land, some friends of mine who were doing studies with... um, it, they're actually the Marin Carbon Project, and they did a study that showed that spreading a thin layer of compost on pasture land kind of wakes up the soil microbes and spurs increased carbon sequestration. Do you? But since we are saying it's impractical to be able to spread compost on land, that much compost, do you think that compost tea could possibly do the same by using that instead of having to put compost down? Um, sure. I, I think it could definitely... If it was high grade premium tea, if they're farming right, definitely it would, you know, because what you have to do when you're doing that, like say, I don't know if they're grazing it or you have to feed these creatures, like you know, with with good fish or um, a great um, humic acid like soyaplex or or things like that. And do you feed them? You mean in the soil once the tea, when or while you're making the tea? While I'm making the tea, one of our most important jobs in farming is is building soil. I'm a soil artist, and so everybody needs to be soil artists. <laughs> one of the funny things is like we had a hemp disaster in Oregon last year, and all these people were coming up, and a friend of mine said, "There's this blueberry." you pick blueberry place they're not doing you pick anymore because they plant hemp in the parking lot well mm-hmm. uh, guess what happened to that crop it's just it's just not a silver bullet thing you know mm-hmm. yeah so mark compost tea then is really something we sh- can either learn to do or we could get compost tea and it goes a lot further than regular compost and i'm curious if compost tea reintroduces um, missing microbes and creatures well i guess i guess it would be more microbes in the tea so does compost tea reintroduce missing microbes to soil and plants right and is that its main benefit right and there's there's all this tea that that's in in cans that's put to sleep and stuff and people ask me about that stuff all the time and i say well if you want to if you want to eat a really fine soup, do you go to a restaurant or do you go to Kroger's and get a, a can of Progresso? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I had another question. I'm wondering what effect restoring the soil microbiome would have on restoring our own microbiome. And I know you've written about this in the past. What it has to do with restoring our microbiome is. Um, now, this is a really important fact. They have the 90 trillion bacteria and other creatures in our gut. It has to be a really healthy micro, healthy system. So to grow the vegetables or the cows or whatever that you want, it has to be supported by all these creatures outside our body. If you have soil that, that's been sprayed by glyphosate, you could be missing all these things, mm-hmm. and so you need you, you need everybody there. Like, like one of the things in my book, and what I always tell you know, what you started this interview out with was the whole neighborhood 
Well, if you're a second grader and you have all these friends and your parents suddenly have to move to the, the, the other side of the country, well, if you're if you could take your friends with you, your living situation would be a lot happier than it is because you don't have any of your friends. Your friends are 3,000 miles away. And so we depend on these friends for our for our lives. Correct. And health. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with listeners um, and with us today about composting or compost tea or soil health? You know, you just have to protect your creatures. That's the most important thing. Um, and don't... Uh, you know, don't give your animals anything you wouldn't take. Because mm-hmm. that's that's the most the most important thing. I don't I don't know if you've seen my card, but I'm an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. An entrepreneur? Yeah. Uh-huh. And so the most important thing is great manure. So basically, you're saying don't feed your animals anything you wouldn't take yourself. And then if you want to protect your creatures, um, it sounds like avoiding toxins like herbicides, glyphosate, aka Roundup, and other toxic chemicals are a good way to start. Um, And then if you're thinking of starting a compost bin, how do you invite these creatures in? Well, if you want to start a compost bin, you know, like everybody's always going, oh, Mark, can I buy worms from you? And, you know, well... All you need to do is get some um, some dewormed horse manure in a pile and put a tarp over it, and you'll have all the worms you want in you know in two weeks. Oh wow, good to know. We're at the end of our time together, and I'm just curious if there's any other story you'd want to share about any of the decomposers, insects, or any creatures that we share the world with. Well, a, a funny story is. Uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe um, I'm a um, aphid researcher, and part of it, I'm the only one doing this research. Is and what I what I teach people is um, you should always, if you have a like a uh, aphid infestation in your kale. Nardi told me this. I said, Nardi, I feel really bad about feeding aphid infested kale to my chickens because it's got to be such great protein. And he says, Well, Mark. I'm so jealous of you because there's nothing healthier than aphid poop (laughs) and it's all sap. And so since then I've been um, eating all the aphids in my garden and I teach the more, um, more you eat, the less you have. And I, I haven't even been able to find any so far this year. So you're an aphid grazer. (laughs) Yeah. And so I wrote about it a few years ago in acres and I got this letter from, from this lady, and I always put in my Acres articles about Marianne, and she's done this, she's done that. Your wife. And this woman wanted, she wanted to move in. And eat aphids with you. And I go, um, <laughs> and I've had a couple of experiences like that, but that, that's been about the, the worst of it. So um, it's just kind of funny, I guess, you know. Gosh, I had no clue about that about aphids that you could do that i know i've eaten them in broccoli unwittingly but um (laughs) yeah yeah no do you eat them raw or do you (laughs) saute i eat them raw and if you Mm -hmm. found that story you'd find that this is some instruction if you want to eat them um it's just that first bite that gags you and after you get past that that gag reflex they really it's kind of like eating oysters on the half shell, except they're, they're, they're sweeter. <laughs> That's so great. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today and educating us about all the creatures that um, live in our, com- hopefully live in our compost. Well, um, thank you, Jill. It's been great talking to you. I, I love uh, talking about the, the people, the underground people. I know. And I do too. It's been really fun. And if you want to get a hold of Mark, you can, I'll put his email in um, the write-up that accompanies this episode. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jill. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. 
For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.